Thank you, Elena, for inviting me today. I really hope that that wow was not a negative wow, it was a positive wow. But we'll see. Um, discussion today, we are trying to coordinate here a little bit, so I got a semi-connected uh, view. And thank you to the technical team there that worked so hard to get it to work. Elena wanted uh, me to discuss today standards for cloud learning from our previous conversation as she mentioned that uh, NIST has been working very, very actively since uh, 2010 in the field and the US government is considered one of the pioneers in, uh, in cloud computing. I don't know how many of you know that uh, cloud computing concept was actually first time introduced by Dr. Kel Lapa from Emory University. He defined, he had a vision, he's a visionaire, IT visionaire, and he had a vision that cloud is an important new computing paradigm where boundaries stop existing, that they will be determined by economic rationale rather than technical limits. How true that is, looking that this happened in 97, when probably many of us were still staying with Oh, thank you, sweetie, yeah. That many of us were staying with the old technology, the classical IT systems. In, uh, since 1997, the international IT uh, literature tried to define many, in many ways the concept, tried to get a grasp of the concept, but it was very difficult. So for many years, for, until about 2010, the world was not there, the world was not ready. The government, in the US, um, decided to renew, to, to modernize the technology, the IT infrastructure. Therefore, the CIO office mandated all government agencies to adopt the cloud first uh, approach policy. What does that mean? It means that if you want to modernize a system, you must look first cloud solution and determine that is suitable or not. If it's suitable, you must go and adopt a cloud-based information system. So in 2011, to be able to move forward with that concept, and because NIST was a leader of the process, helping, supporting government agencies with the technological uh, guidance and standards, we started by uh, defining cloud, what cloud is, a short and sweet document that became known worldwide and adopted by international community too. The fact that we today discuss about um, infrastructure as a service, and we all know what that means, software as a service or platform as a service, a public cloud, a private cloud, we owe that to that document, to these people, to the authors that brainstorm based on the research that they've done, the perception of the communities and settling on concepts. They identify what is coming new, the five characteristics of a cloud, what, how can we distinguish between um, classical IT and what cloud is, basically the utility concept. That was about the time when uh, I was appointed to lead the security and later the forensic work at NIST and support the um, NIST mission. When uh, I had one morning, um, I had my own epiphany. So I'm going one morning to my eye doctor. I've been seeing him on a regular basis for years and in that particular day when I'm going, his office was totally modernized, was changed, and I'm getting in, instead of having uh, you know, the front desk there with the lots of pretty ladies, I only had kiosks. One lady was directing me to go and check myself in, pay over credit card at the kiosk, and then I'm getting into the office, I'm waiting for the doctor, and the moment the doctor gets in, he comes and says, Doctor, you guys, welcome to, I'm, I would like to welcome you. How do you see me in the cloud? My jaw dropped because I thought that somebody told on me that I started a new job and uh, I'm, that's my expertise. And I said, what do you mean, doctor? I said, yes, I was told that I should greet all our patients with this statement. How do they see us in the cloud? 
okay, I'm breathing deeply, but I'm starting heart rate dilating in the same time. And, and he is, um, I, I'm continuing because my attention was totally in the cloud world. So I said, do you really know? What do you mean? I said, I know they told me that we are in the cloud right now. But do you know what that means? No, I have absolutely no idea. Well, I'm trying to explain to him and said, I, don't, I know nothing about it. My son that just graduated from school is our system administrator for my business. So he decided that we need to go to the cloud, whatever that is. I couldn't stay there, believing me or not, because I knew with my expertise in the field what the implications are where you don't know what we are getting on. I had to find, I had to talk to his son, I had to find where his business is, and after my personal discussion, I, I felt comfortable going back because I realized that going to the cloud, his system and my data was protected better than the way he was protecting it before. When his Wi-Fi had no password, when he was transferring all the information via voice, voice over IP, to a center and so on. So my Value proposition, because we are moving our lives to the internet online, is that we need to have effective security for cloud to take maximum advantage of cloud. But the, the other side of the coin is that we need cloud computing to help us to manage the security programs that the internet of things requires nowadays. Imagine that our life is moving in the direction in which you receive email from your refrigerator because you are running out of milk. So the refrigerator will send you an email and then we'll put that on the list for the store that will deliver the email, the, the, the milk to you at home. Or your car decides that has a technical issue, communicates with uh, the dealer, takes itself to the dealer and then comes back after it's fixed and parks itself in the garage. In such a world, which is the world we are moving to, we need to have better security. I would like to recap a little bit the world I'm coming from and what happened in 2015 and why is it important to have better security. We have the Office of Personal Management, 22 million records that were exposed. Those were records of people that had clearance and that worked for government. You can see there that there is a report from Krebs on security on all those incidents. It's important, and I will, you'll figure out why. We had also we had also Anthem. Anthem is keeping all our medical records. 80 million records that were lost, that were exposed. Those were all bad news for me in 2015 because now you have information of people, you add to that information their health records. The good news for me in 2015 was I was not on Ashley Medicine website. <laughs> so they couldn't black blackmail me for that. That's a dating site for people that were cheating on their spouses. But if you look at the structure of somehow it went faster than I clicked. Somebody clicked for me there. It's OK. Here we are. If you look at where those bridges were, you will figure out that someone, that this is pure espionage, because somebody will have your name, your information, your records, your um, clearance information there, will have your health record, and if you dare to cheat on your spouse, they will have all the information they need to blackmail you. But we are in the IT world, and refrigerators and toasters can be used to create one of the largest denial of service attack that happened just recently, about two weeks, less than two weeks ago was double in size, 660, I think, Akamai um, 
determined 660 kilobytes per second. The largest now, until now, it was only half of this. 320, I believe, kilo, uh, gigabytes per second. I apologize. Gigabytes per second, yeah. S gigabits, sorry. So you can imagine that we expose ourselves to a tremendous threat. The surface, the complexity of our sur uh, systems increase, and the surface of attack increase also tremendously. The entire world roar about this because this was an attack against, as you can see there, crabs. And the reason why is because he blocked against them. Imagine that the target has a much higher value. It's not just a revenge. Akamai fought this attack for three days. They resisted, but it can get worse. I would like to just brief you a little bit, as Elena asked me, on the work that we've done, that we are doing, that we've done and continue to do at NIST, to provide guidance and develop standards for government agencies and the population at large to use the ones that uh, are looking at adopting cloud solutions. I won't have time to get deeply into any of those projects, but I would like you to have to taste the wine and then you can come back to us, you can contact me, and I can elaborate on any of those. So existing projects. We started with developing a security reference architecture that is in draft form and provided also a tool to um, be able to deliver the, the data that the document is uh, associated with. We developed a security controls and, and cloud -based, for cloud-based information systems. We also developed the risk management framework for cloud ecosystems from the consumer's perspective. And also current work as a forensic reference architecture. For the ones that were here yesterday, I posted to, uh, to Mr. Giannu a question regarding the forensic. Well, that was what I had in mind. We need all to collaborate to get a good, uh, to have a good outcome. New project. We are working and I'll go over all of them in more details. But in the interest of time, I'd like to go in very briefly discuss it's not changing. How can we get a good cloud? Select from the Chinese menu. That was the first thing that we did. We tried to help consumers to build a, a good cloud. So we took a Lego approach when it comes to architecting a cloud environment. We had to leverage standards that we had out there. Please work with me. So we leveraged the standards that we have, the NIST reference architecture, which was well known. And to more importance to people out here, because we are in Europe, we leverage to develop a methodology of how can you approach, how can you develop this Lego um, cloud based on information that was already available there. So we discovered the Cloud Security Alliance enterprise architecture, which allowed you to work with 346 functional capabilities to build in a cloud environment a system of your choice up to an entire enterprise. That was critical for us because that helped us start building a bridge between what we are doing in the government space and what public is doing out there. Cloud Security Alliance, even though it's, uh, it's a partner competitive partner to EuroCloud, they do good work. And I like to look around and have collaboration and leverage everything that is good out there. We don't like to reinvent. We like to move faster forward by collaborating and producing something that is useful to the entire world, not just to our world. There are tools that we provide, is that Cubic Rub, Cloud uh, Security Cubic, Rubik's Cube that uh, I highlighted there, so the entire data can be visualized. 
This is the one is available for download. We are trying to make it available through our general service. And to be able to truly help government agencies was not enough to determine that you want particular functional capabilities. So we had to go all the way down to low granularity to identify the security controls that you need to implement. Those are security controls from our catalog, 853. But because we were lucky and used the Cloud Security Alliance approach and capabilities, they do provide set of controls from other catalogs, from ISO, from PCI, from um, SOX. They provide controls that are mapped to those capabilities also. So what we are doing there and the approach can, and methodology can be used by others at large. Good. Good was good, but not good enough. So we wanted to create cheap clouds. But when I say cheap, it doesn't mean cheap in the sense that it doesn't provide enough. So we are looking for approaches of getting for government space something that is at the lower value. So the idea was, if we have an entity out there that the government agencies trust, and this is FedRAMP that was created a federal um, uh, risk management uh, assessment program is on our behalf is going and assessing clouds for standards that were established that are a baseline for all government agencies then we can go and shop on their list and we need to pay only for the Delta to negotiate what we need extra. So that was a very important process. But how you end up there, how you end up to determine what is that you need, is something that we had to work on and try to help government agencies. And this was the risk management framework for cloud ecosystem. We worked for many years for systems that we were managing. So. From purchasing the hardware, we were building the systems, and we knew how to do that. So the risk management framework for a classical IT was Bible to us. So we knew that. This is the one that we see. But if you look at what you have to do if you are a consumer, and you play with the idea of moving or adopting a system in a cloud environment, there are additional steps that you have to go through. And those are the ones that are highlighted in green. This image is just gives you it's a visual thing that gives you a flavor of the delta, the difference or extra that you have to do. And how do those correlate one to each other? So you have to have, when you start the process, you have to have the vision because you need to deal with that um, iceberg architecture type. Whatever happens below the water, it's something that you need to gain visibility into to be able to trust the system. Whatever you manage, which is above the water, we know how to do that. We learned and we've done that for many years. Is the upper part, is the risk management framework that you apply to the top stack that is under your management. Providers are doing very good jobs, but are doing very good jobs with the information that they have, so they manage the lower part of the system. Having that vision in the wrapper and cyclic approach for the entire system is what you need. And what FedRAM does for us is saves money and gives us confidence that this part here is well done and serves our purpose. What we need to understand, though, is when a provider does a fantastic job to you know, create a service, they will build a system around a hole here, an assumption of the type of data that you have. You are the only one that knows what kind of data goes in there. You are the only one that have to build a top layer here, and you have to serve your, delta, your da data here and properly categorize it in such a way that when you put the system together, it works seamlessly. And it inherits all the controls from the bottom without any problem that you can leverage them. That they, and if you don't, you need to understand what's, ho what's happening in the lower part and you need to compensate or tailor the controls. You need to have this understanding because you need to build 
a boundary, a trust boundary around the system. We are probably all familiar with the perimeter of a system, the classical IT, in which you can wrap your arms around and you put their big walls, tall walls, and you can protect your system inside and you keep uh, the perimeter all the enemies there. We are no longer there. This trust boundary is elastic, it's a logical concept. But you need to know and understand the system to be able to properly operate the system and to be able to authorize your data on the system. We used the information that we had and uh, forensic was a big challenge in the cloud environment because of the nature, because of the new technology and because of the model, a utility model in which you, the owner of the data, don't have access to the stack all the way to the bottom and when there is a breach, you don't know probably for days, it's very much like cancer. Until it starts really acting or it's too late, you don't know that you have a breach. You might not even find out when it happened, for how long it was there, and how much data was exfiltrated. So trusting the system is important. Knowing how to do forensic there is very important. So we built, we did a lot of research Sorry, I went backwards, and, and um, I didn't do the backwards, but it happened. So we created a document that is highlighting the challenges that forensic, forensic investigators are faced with. But we are using these challenges basically to identify the elements, the components in that building block approach of security architecture to see which elements in that architecture have forensic artifacts to be able to create leveraging the challenges of forensic reference architecture. The new project, as I promised. The lady here asked me what am I working on. There are so many interesting projects that I don't even know with, with which one to start. But I guess the one that I left at the end is the one that will make probably the biggest impact if we get it right. Definition of application containers and microservices. Many people are complaining that of vendor locking. How can you get out of there? Probably containers is one of the approach. Application containers, it's a new technology, it's different, it's not just VM, but we need to see what's going on because containers operate with admin rights, so we need to know what's, what they are doing on our behalf. So defining what application containers and microservices is, putting a, a frame to the concept, and then looking at the challenges, our projects that we're working on, the definition is out there, we closed the public comments on that, and we are currently working with the security working group, which by the way I forgot to mention, the security working group that I'm chairing has more than 900 people from around the world that have the um, kindness and um, uh, to collaborate with us on a volunteer basis, and so we can produce something that meets their needs and their expectations too. We work also on federated identity. Many of the projects that were discussed here yesterday are critical and leverage federated identities. But when that federation happens in a cloud environment, there is another entity there that can get access to your data, to your identities. What's the impact? How the threat vector changes is something that we are looking at. What are the challenges to implement? This is work in progress. New and interesting is definition of fog, mist, edge computing. How many of you knows what fog computing is? Mist computing, edge computing, fluid computing. Follow me cloud. I heard that too. Let's see. Let's go and see what fog computing is. So open fog consortium has a definition for fog computing that comes the closest to our research shows that uh, is the understanding of fog computing. So we have cloud which is
we have cloud. Right. So we have cloud, which is centralized system. It's huge, it's massive, it's out there, but it can have latencies for, for Internet of Things devices, might, might be too slow, which is interesting, right? Because we thought cloud is very fast. So this is how the concept of fog computing evolved. It's a service of cloud-like that is delivered closer to the device, to the edge. And then it's mist computing, M-I-S-T, not N-I-S-T, which is the lower layer here, is all the way at the bottom among your IoT devices. So the idea is that in order to help your refrigerator to deal with the email, uh, to send you emails for your milk, uh, to help uh, all the bulbs that need to communicate when to turn off and when to turn on, they need to have a platform. If you have temperature sensors, you don't need those sensors to constantly, every minute or every five minutes, to communicate their temperature. So this layer here, the mist layer, can aggregate that and then can transfer that information to the fog, which has analytic power, which has computational and storage power and reduces latency, but is not as powerful, is not as um, agnostic of the of the service, if you wish, or uh, of the entity of the device at the end as uh, cloud is. So uh, fog is more specialized, but it gives you many of the features that cloud has and reduces latency. Those are things that are coming. Those are things that are supporting IoT. And all this layer here, people are referring to it as edge computing. Fog computing was introduced by Cisco. Mist computing was introduced by Cisco too, but it's needed. So we need to look into it, we need to define it, to be able to address challenges, to be able to evolve the concept. Here, that's cloud, this is fog, this is mist. The last project, which is my baby, is how to get the cloud to be faster. If we look at the risk management framework that I showed earlier, there are several of the steps there that can be automated if we are able to structure the information in such a way that, and the difference is, imagine that you have a letter and you want to send a letter from here from Bucharest to your grandma in Faulty Chen. If you don't structure the letter properly, the post office is one, will not be able to deliver that information. It's like the message in the bottle. If you leave that message in pure language, human language, you cannot automate it. You can do very little things about it. So if we are able to automate the process of delivering and assessing security information, then we'll be way ahead of the game. So we are working on developing an open security controls assessment language. Um, abstract language, think of XML set of schemas and framework. How many of you are familiar with that? Great, so it's a hierarchical language I would like to take that. That allow you to describe the catalog controls of your choice, the one you want to use, that help you create an overlay. The overlay is a concept that we are using in, in our gov US government space, meaning I'm taking this catalog, but the controls there are agnostic of the technology that I want to use the controls for. Think 27001 is not going to tell you it's cloud, it's, it's for every IT system, it's for mobile, it's for um, um, cyber physical systems. So you define the technology, so you have to customize in, in a way those, to tailor in the way those controls. So the language will, will allow you to describe that, to be specific. And then you can determine the purpose for that control to be implemented. 
I showed to you the capabilities that uh, Lego approach. So a control can be implemented, like access control can be implemented at different levels in the stack. Whatever you implement it, you'll have specifics about access control. So you have to define how that is implementing. The language will allow, will allow you to do that. So implementation information, who can benefit from that? Well, from the implementation information, consumers of cloud can benefit because they can define the implementation. The providers can because they can describe in a better way, in a way that the consumer can uh, automate the review and uh, the description of the service that is provided or acquired. And also authorities, assessment authorities or certification, validation authorities, however you want to call them, can use those uh, schemas, the implementation schemas. Assessment schemas. Assessment schemas can also be used by consumers and said, well, this is how I want those controls to be assessed. And you take that information and put it It's part of the service level objectives, as part of the contract that you end up closing with the service level agreement. That is part of your service agreement, the contract that you are signing with. I think that I missed something there. I clicked too soon. And then authorities that are certifying providers can also specify how those controls how have to be assessed. Why is that important? If I am an authority that is assessing a provider, I want to make sure that I do it in a repeatable way. I want to make sure that nobody will come back to me and say, hey, you are biased, because I'm a human. So I'm going to go and uh, hire a third party independent assessor to whom I'm going to tell, this is how you, I would like you to go and do the job. That has to be an entity that has no gain from working with me or working with a provider. So he's very, truly independent. In this way, I know that the process that I'm, um, that I'm supporting, the assessment process, is, is rigorous and is repeatable, which is very important. So I gain trust through that approach. So when consumers are coming to buy something from my list there of assessed providers, they trust that I did a good job on their behalf. But one other thing that is very important to have are the metrics. There are controls that are measurable. So you need to know what's the latency and you need to be able to define that value and you need to be able to monitor that value. And if you automate that one, you sleep better so you don't have to stay there watching it. You just get a warning when it goes off. And the standard deviation from what you have in the contract is bigger or if you had a breach. Information can be used by consumers. Information can be used by providers to define that this is what I'm offering to you. This is what I want, says consumer. And we are around the table to negotiate it. And that's information that is used for continuous monitoring. Because it's not enough to assess and authorize a service once and then you go to sleep. You have to continuously, in the near real time, monitor the system. It's your data, it's your responsibility to secure it. And the language also support any other kind of information that you want to use, you want to provide, you want to customize, you want to automate. This is my baby. It's a project that we started a couple of months back. And we hope that if we do it right, we can apply this language to any technology, not just cloud, and to any standard. So we are hoping that we can propose it to international standards. Therefore, I'm calling for collaboration on this project. And I do have, I would like to know that what we're doing is useful. So if you want to collaborate, if you want to see if what we are doing is useful to you too, to give us a feedback in the process rather than waiting at the end to do the work and then redo it to satisfy the needs of a larger community, then please come forward and contact me. With this, I would like to thank you all. This is my contact information.